We do have a template, and uh, that really is like 90% of the people stick with that template, which it's not elaborate. It's basically a module structure um, where they have a, an existing rhythm in throughout the whole course so that the technology can kind of disappear for the student. Um, so, you know, they can change it if they want. We can't make them do anything, right? Um, most of them really appreciate that structure and they've done some pretty extraordinary things. We give them all kinds of options for lecture, including um, Alex's uh, 50 things to do besides lecture. Um, I lecture in one course, I don't lecture in another. I use some of my own examples, but um, again, don't build my course, build yours. We have a checklist. It's not officially, uh, we don't actually sign off on courses. We um, train people. We voluntarily sit down with the checklist, which became, after some faculty in DC review, a suggested best practices guidelines list. So uh, very optional, but adhering to most of the same things that SUNY um, adheres to. And we just go through, and you know, the faculty member says, oh yeah, you know, I don't really have a good welcome thing. They're not going to know what to do next. Or, oh, you know, you're right. Maybe I should have a little, a little bit more interactivity here. Um, once they've done, they've built the course, we've done the checklist, it all goes to the DC, and the DC looks at it and says, um, you know, sometimes they say, well, this doesn't, isn't quite rigorous enough, or, you know, there's things missing that I really want for everybody in my department to have. I want to lecture every week, I want a, a writing assignment every week, or, you know, I don't like this structure, um, let me work, and then maybe you can help them with the tools. Uh, and then we get a DC approval form and put it on file. But again, um, that's a protocol that was approved by the school. A um, lot of leeway for faculty members if they've got back, you know, I had somebody that did a lot of training with SUNY Learning Network and did a lot over it um, in the ETAP program, had taught online. She came in, we spent a little bit of time looking at um, what tools we had available and she pretty much did her own thing. Um, so we'd, we can customize it. We have a couple of really interesting things that I think you'll enjoy. One is we, um, because we have the content system, or the content collection, we realized that we could build a um, course information section that had all the tools that a student might need, you know, who to contact for help, where, where to go if you're an international student or a student who has learning disabilities, needs something like that. We figured out that we could put all these um, student resources including little mini things on, you know, here's how to copy and paste, uh, here's how to save things, here's how to use an assignment, here's how to take a test, into the course information folder on the menu, but they all link to files or um, HTML objects in the content collection. So uh, we had a problem where people would use the template, make the course, and then for six years, <laughs> they would just keep forwarding it, with everything would be wrong in their course information, they never checked it. Um, now, if they start with our template, no matter how many times they move it forward, they still have uh, updated information because we'll update it and it'll update in everybody's courses. Um, and we can actually send them just that little piece or import that little piece for them. And everything else that's in there, very bare bones. Um, we have that section, uh, we have blank spaces for them to put in basically a web version of their syllabus. So, you know, that's, a, that's kind of a, a big shock. What do you mean I have to like, you can't, I can't just put this paper up? It's like, well, do you go to Zappos, download a document, fill it out, go through to find page four to find the shoes that you want, and then, you know, go back online, fill something out? No, you know, you go to shoes, you go to women, <laughs> you go to size eight, um, it's there. It's a, you're working in a web environment. So that's a big training step is recognizing that they have a web interface to a very powerful suite of tools, but it is a web interface. You know, break everything down. And then we use a little module structure. It's very bare bones. It's like, this is an item for readings. Here's a folder for readings. You might have a lot of readings. You might want to put them in a folder. You might have one reading. You might make it an item. So you can decide based on your course which you're going to use. Here's an example of both. So we have an annotated module. It has a folder, a placeholder for a quiz, a placeholder for an assignment a placeholder for like a bunch of readings, a placeholder for anything that might be lecture material, um, a placeholder for readings, and uh, we make a couple of copies. They're just like, you know, module X title. And we show them how they can make one prototype and copy it. 
uh, what we ask them to design that instructional sequence or those folder structures on is uh, we have them start with a matrix, which is just a table. And I use that great Karen Swan you know, synthesis of those 65 articles um, where she just has the Venn diagram of you know, teaching presence, social presence, cognitive presence, and the interaction with that environment. So she does it all in terms of interactions. <clears throat> she calls it, um, I think the whole article is just interactions. We give that to them before they start. And then we say, what are the interactions that you have in your classroom that you think are really successful? Don't worry about how we're going to get them online. Don't worry if you can get them online or if it'll be hard to do. Just what are your interactions? What are your interactions with content? Oh, they read a book. Oh, they watch videos. Oh, they might you know, go and do research. Oh, they interact with you. Oh, there's, they talk to each other. Oh, there's quizzes. So we list those things across the top of the matrix. We list the topics down the, the left on the, um, for the rows. And we say, all right, here's your roadmap, and this is what you're going to fill out for students. And we'll start filling this out as we learn new tools and what you can do. And by week five, you'll completely blow it up and start over. But here's, here's how we're going to start. Um, thinking about it. And, you know, that and the other article we give them is the old Educause article from 2001, Mind Over Matter, about a course management system does not tell you how to teach. You know, it's just an aggregate of tools. And it's like teaching social studies where English used to be taught, bring in a different book, move the chairs, right? So this is, these are just tools. And the more you know about them, the more you can do. And that's it. That's really all that's in that template. What I do is I direct a team of uh, 12 people who work on our master courses. So we have uh, almost 500 online courses and we use a master model approach, which means that uh, the instructional designer works with a faculty member and uh, works on the, the design of that particular course. And then that course is poured into multiple sections for people to teach from. Uh, so I have, uh, in, in our particular department, there are nine, um, nine professional staff who work directly on the courses. I have one who also works on instructor development, so new instructor orientation, um, those sort of things. And then I have two support staff. So uh, we have a very large kind of operation, making sure that all those courses stay um, uh, current. When textbooks change, faculty will request a course revision, and that's when we come in. One of the big things um, that we try to do is, is map what we're doing to best practices and to research. And so if you look at um, m most research studies about persistence and retention and online, you're going to see things like uh, clarity of, and, and consistency for navigation. That's, it seems like a very straight forward thing, but having uh, for a student to get into a course and, and not have that be a barrier, you know, content is hard enough to sometimes learn, so it should not be difficult for them to know where do I click to, you know, find my syllabus and where do I, how does a discussion forum work and those sort of things. So we try to make sure that our courses have some kind of consistent look and feel for the student. That's, that's number one. The other thing is making sure that we're chunked appropriately. So now we're talking about the content. If you do too much, if you bring you know, too much text or um, uh, too much information in one module, that's going to cause overload for those students. So we're constantly looking to make sure that we've scaffolded things correctly, that, um, that we're bringing in technology when technology makes sense. A lot of times uh, it's, people want to use a new technology because it's new. But we have, always have to go back to say, OK, is that meeting the learning objective? How can we meet that learning objective? Is this going to really make sense for the student? You don't want the technology to be too difficult for them to learn and then take away from that learning process. Uh, so those are some of the key basics. Um, we are looking at doing um, two main uh, uh, huge projects right now. One is making sure that our learning uh, activities and our outcomes and our objectives are all aligned so that not only you know when the student comes in they clearly see that this is what i'm going to be learning and you make sure that everything that you're doing will help them get there and be able to take that assessment at the end that shows that they actually learned that so that's key to making a good online course um, and then accessibility which is one of the things i've been talking about uh, quite a bit lately and that's making sure that 
everything in that course is uh, as accessible as it can be for every student, including those who might have a disability. So technology that they use has to be available and, and, and accessible uh, no matter what. If they're using an assistive technology, um, maybe they're not using an assistive technology. You know, so you have to go through and, and, and check everything, links, um, and, and things that are optional. Sometimes people think that if it's optional, then I don't have to have it be accessible, and that's not true. Even though it's a master course and it's already, it doesn't mean that some, the instructor can't come in and now do things to it to kind of enhance it and make it kind of feel their own. Or maybe they have a special expertise that is above and beyond what's in that course. They can bring that in and they can share that. So, for instance, when I was teaching geology, you know, I did uh, uh, appetite fission track dating when I was um, doing my research. And so I would get to a certain section of that course and I would infuse that even though it's not something that was totally always in the course because that's something unique that I could bring as the instructor. And so I think, you know, having that, that kind of modular based clear structure for students, getting them in there, getting them active, providing opportunities for them to be able to, uh, to work through projects with each other, and then also providing ways for them to interact with the faculty member. So, so the faculty member can have, you know, um, we, have, we use Blackboard Collaborate, so some kind of a web conferencing thing that they could then interact with them same time, whether it's optional, usually we say optional because again, adults are busy and they can't always be there at that same time, but you can still offer those things. And then those who, who, who really need that kind of help, they are, they're gonna benefit from it. You can record it, you can have it there later for those who could not make it. Mm -hmm.